Hello and welcome to part two of this video series where we're looking at making a bust of Cthulhu, the Elder God. Now apologies that it's taken me a while to get around to doing this video series, but I unfortunately became preoccupied by other projects, uh, mostly my Tywin Lannister sculpture, which I also have some videos about on my channel, so check those out if you're interested. I had the casts all ready to go for this, but I just hadn't quite got around to painting them up. Now here's a sculpture from the first part of the video, it's uh, done in Chavant oil clay. In this part of the video we're going to be looking at making a mould, doing some casts, and then painting up the final piece. So the first part of the process here is to make a mould and I need to make an enclosure. I'm using foam core to do this. So what I'm doing here is just trimming down the copper pipe uh, to make it a bit shorter and I'm gluing the sculpture into the wooden base. This is just so it's nice and secure during the moulding process and so that it won't move around when the silicon's poured in. So I've just put a bit of hot glue in there to secure it in place. As you can see I'm also putting some clay around the bottom here. This is just to make sure that the mould has a nice smooth transition from the sculpture to the pouring spout. So if you think about it this is where the resin is going to come out when I pour it into the final mould. I'm also gluing a piece of dowel in place here. What I've decided to do is to include a pouring spout. So the idea here is that you can imagine that the sculpture will make an impression in the mould and so will the piece of dowel. And what I want to do is have a separate channel for the resin to flow in. The resin can then flow into the impression where the sculpture is and out through the stem. So now that I've got that done I'm cutting some foam board to size and gluing it in place. This is to create an enclosure that will keep the silicon contained when I pour it in to make the final mould. If you've seen some of my previous videos you may have seen this before. What I'm doing is to cut up some old silicon moulds that I don't need anymore and I'm just cutting them to small pieces. What you can do is drop those into the dead areas of your mould, that's areas which don't actually touch the sculpture, and they'll just fill it in, meaning you won't need as much silicon to make the final mould. This is quite handy since silicon can be quite expensive. So there's my enclosure almost complete and as you can see I'm just putting a few blocks of silicon down the bottom there. There's some quite large areas which are just empty voids so I'm filling those up as much as I can. So there's my enclosure with the final side glued on. I mentioned in the previous part of the video that my fiance had bought me a vacuum chamber and a vacuum pump for my birthday. Now I've spoken previously about making moulds and one of the problems you can run into is air bubbles in your mould which can lead to distorted casts and just unwanted shapes um, on your sculpture. Now one way to get around that is to use a vacuum chamber to pump all of the air out of the chamber and out of the silicon that you've just mixed up. I've previously got around this by simply leaving the silicon for 10 to 20 minutes and as you can see here a lot of air does bubble out of the silicon and more than you may imagine is actually in there. The vacuum pump's a little bit more effective at doing it um, and this is really my first time using one for this purpose so it's a bit of a learning curve for me as well. So I'm mixing up some silicon rubber here and I've covered this in previous videos as well. This is what they call a condensation cure silicon, meaning that you add a small proportion of catalyst to the rubber. You mix it thoroughly and that allows it to set. Now it's that mixing process so that it can introduce the air that we need to get rid of. So once I finish mixing this up, I'm going to put the pot into the vacuum chamber and pump out the air. So as you can see, as the pressure decreases, the air in the silicon is forced out. The silicon begins to rise up and almost boil as the air leaves it. And it's quite surprising how much it actually does this. Um, I was prepared for it, so I'd seen it before in, in videos on YouTube. Um, I think the trick seems to be to get it about level so it doesn't uh, overflow the container. And the manual says to let the air out very quickly. And as you can see, it sort of flies all over the place. Now, I realised afterwards that the reason it did that is because the air intake was directly over the pot of silicon. So that's what's caused it to splat all over the place. Um, so the next time I do it, I think I'll just have to offset it slightly so the air rushing in doesn't cause the silicon to fly everywhere. Now I actually found out to my cost that um, that was what was going on when I tried to do this with some resin um, and that caused the resin to fly all over the interior of the pot as well which was a little bit more problematic to clean up than the silicon. For the silicon you can just wait for it to dry and then peel it off and that's fine. The resin has a tendency to stick to everything so that was a little bit more messy. So 
So now I'm just pouring my degas silicon into my mold. Um, it's just a question of, again, I mean, although I've degassed it, I'm still doing it very slowly and taking care to allow the silicon to flow slowly over the sculpture. This is just so there's still the potential for air to get trapped as the silicon rises up over the sculpture. So I want to try and eliminate that as much as possible as well. So the silicon's now set and I'm just pulling away the foam board which is actually harder than you might think. I think it may have stuck to the silicon. Nevertheless, once I've got that out of the way, what I'm now doing is cutting open the mould. Now there are a load of different ways of making moulds and if you've seen some of my previous videos you would have seen me make a two part matrix mould. So with that you actually have a separation between the two halves of the mould. That's one way of doing it. What I'm doing here is literally just cutting open the silicon with a Stanley knife and uh, not pictured as me slicing my finger to pieces in the process. The um, silicon is actually quite tough. Different types of silicon have different degrees of springiness so this one was quite firm. Um, but nevertheless um, eventually you've got it cut open and as you can see I'm pulling out the uh, sculpture here and it's coming away in bits which is pretty much what you expect. If you've done a sculpture in a soft material it's probably going to get destroyed uh, and even stuff in hard materials can sometimes get destroyed as well. So there are the bits coming up. As you can see I've cut it with a wavy line and the reason for that is just so the two parts of the mould go back together again um, so it won't be misaligned. So there's the cavity in the mould there, and as you can see it's also got the uh, pouring spout as well. So all you need is a couple of elastic bands to hold the mould together. You could put a few bits of wood on either side if you wanted just to sort of evenly distribute the force of the bands, but I find that it's not always necessary. So the mould's ready to be poured and I am mixing up some resin here. This is a polyester resin. So similar to the silicon, you have your, your resin and you put a small amount of catalyst in. In this case I'm also adding some white pigment so that the resin will come out um, tinted. It's going to come out in a sort of an off-white colour. Um, this is just because of the colour of the resin itself. So as you can see I'm pouring the resin into the pouring spout and this is going to flow through the curve that I added in clay up through the impression of the sculpture and out the stem. Now I did have some footage of me putting the cast out of the mould but I'm not quite sure where it's gone. Anyway as you can see I've done a few casts here um, and to the camera they look pretty good. Um, I'm quite happy with them but there are some uh, differences between them. Now I mentioned previously that I managed to fire resin all over the interior of my vacuum chamber um, and the reason I had resin in the chamber in the first place is because I wanted to try and eliminate air bubbles as much as possible uh, which is why I degassed the silicon in the first place. However you can also introduce air into the mould when you pour the resin in. Um, the same process of stirring the resin can introduce air into it in the same way that stirring the silicon can. So I thought it would be a good idea to degas my resin in as well before I poured it in. Now if you're doing casting professionally you generally use a pressure chamber to do your casts and the way that works is instead of sucking air out it pumps air in and increases the pressure and what that has the effect of doing is to squeeze all of the air bubbles in the mould into very very tiny bubbles so that they're no longer an issue. Now I don't have a pressure chamber although I do intend to get one so I thought maybe if I can degas the resin before I pour it in that would actually help uh, and it has to an extent so the first cast here is the one that I degas and while there are some small air bubbles generally speaking the cast is pretty good. However if we look at the other two casts here you can see that there's some fairly large air bubbles in here. Now these generally form on the back of the mould and this is where the air has bubbled up through the cast. So you can see quite a few of them on the back here and also there's quite a big one on the end tentacle. Um, it's not too much of a problem because I can use some uh, epoxy just to fill in those, those bubbles. I'm now moving on to painting the model and I'm using some Tamiya colours here. What I found is an off yellow colour called yellow green, so it's just a yellow with a tinge of green to it, so I thought that would look pretty good for an octopoid creature. Now I would normally go and undercoat the model, um, and I generally use sprays to do that, however I'm currently living in a rented flat, so I don't have access to a garden, and I don't want to risk spray painting in the kitchen just in case I get paint um, all over the place and uh, damage, the, damage the kitchen. 
So what I'm doing here is just painting directly to the resin, and this is working fairly well. I have found I have needed to give it a, one or two more coats in certain places just to get the coverage even, but I think it's working out fairly well. So I'm now taking some Humbral Mascal, and this is something I've used in a previous painting video. It's basically a type of latex, and what it allows you to do is to mask off certain areas of the model so you can define where you want the paint to go. Now I mentioned in the previous part of this video that I wanted to use certain marine animals as an inspiration for the colouring and the paint scheme that I would give this model. So what I'm doing here is just marking in some rough ringlets on the creature's head. What's going to happen here is that where the mascot is, the paint will peel away. But where I haven't put mask all, the paint will stay. So what this should hopefully allow me to do is come up with some markings on the surface of the creature that look quite random and have some quite sharp lines. So what I'm going to do is just do a quick test on the head here, see how that looks, and if I like how it looks, I'll then replicate that on the rest of the body. So I'm now adding some blue onto the areas that I've masked off. And what I'm doing is putting the blue in the center of the ringlets that I've painted on there. Once I'm happy that this test has worked out as I hope, I'll then paint Maskell all over the model and just cover the whole thing in blue. But at the minute I'm just being a little bit more precise so I can see what's going on. So I've now let everything dry and as you can see I'm now peeling off the mascal and you can really just do this by rubbing it with your thumb and then pulling off the resultant pieces and as you can see it's coming off quite easily and the paint's flaking off around it but the bits in the centre are staying put. So there's my masked off colour scheme with some areas of blue over a yellow base and I think that looks quite nice. It looks like the sort of coloration that I could believe a marine creature might have uh, and after all he is an elder god so I guess he can have whatever coloration he likes. So um, that seems to have worked so what I'm now going to do is carry on and add mask all over the entire head, do a similar pattern and then I'm going to paint the entire thing blue, do the same peeling off process and that should give us a similar colour scheme over the entire head. So I'm going in and painting more patterns onto the model with Maskell and what I'm trying to do is just sort of do basic rough ringlets. So as you can see I'm using a brush which is a little bit messed up um, and I think that's useful because it does add a degree of randomness to the, to the pattern that I'm painting on here. So there's the Maskell dried. Hopefully you can see where there's some areas that are covered in mascal and some areas that aren't. So as I mentioned, the areas that aren't covered in mascal is where the blue paint is going to stay. And I'm now going on and basically just painting blue paint all over the area that I've covered in mascal. Now I'm generally using Tamiya paints here. Um, I don't generally favour one type of paint or another. They happen to have some particularly stark bright colours that I thought would be quite useful for the sort of sea creature look that I'm going for. Tammy also do quite a lot of quite muted colours which are quite good for vehicles and things like that and I've mostly seen these being used for model military vehicles, things like that. But these colours just seem quite nice so I thought I'd go with that. I do use a variety of other paints as well like Citadel Miniatures or Humbral. Um, so I really just go for whatever seems appropriate for the project. The only thing I've found as a drawback for Tamiya is the fact that if you sort of paint um, flat planes with it and you do too many brush strokes, the paint, because it's an acrylic, it's a, basically a plastic, the acrylic can start sort of rolling up if you let it dry and then apply another coat. So you can sometimes get quite sort of ugly lumps and bumps in it. But as long as you're aware of that issue and don't um, overdo the uh, paint strokes as you're doing it, I found that it's generally pretty good. So there's a the blue paint layer all dry, and I'm now going in to peel off the mask. This is a slightly more involved job than previously because I've covered the entire thing in blue paint. I'm having to sort of remember where I've put the mask, but it's generally, a, as I said before, a case of rubbing it with your thumb. You'll find that the latex rolls up and bubbles up, and then it's just a case of pulling it away. You will get some paint that flakes up and sort of comes away from the model. You can just press it back down with your thumb and it seems to stick. But the advantage of using this technique is the fact that it gives you quite stark lines between the different areas of paint. And there's also a degree of randomness to the edges. And I think that would be quite difficult to replicate with a paintbrush. So there's the head all done now. And I think that's looking pretty good actually. It sort of does look a little bit like uh, some octopus markings that I've seen in nature documentaries. So I've now gone ahead and done exactly the same technique to the rest of the body.
So there's my masking complete. And what I'm doing quickly is to go in with a lighter shade of yellow. I'm just picking out some of the highlights, the raised areas on the model, just to give it a bit of variation in color. What I'm now doing is going in with a clear lacquer. Now this is another Tamiya called Clear Yellow. It's basically a transparent um, lacquer with a gloss coat. And what I'm doing is coating the whole model in there and it's translucent so it lets the colors show through that you've already put on but it sort of has the effect of tying everything together. I don't know if you can see the video but what it's doing is sort of turning my blue areas slightly green which I suppose isn't surprising if you're putting a yellow and a blue together they're going to go green but um, I quite like the way this is looking it's making the blues um, stand out slightly less it's sort of giving a cohesion to the overall model which I quite like. Now I'm really making this up as I'm going along so I didn't know it's going to do this but I think it's quite a nice effect so that's quite cool. The basic technique I use for painting models these days is to do a base coat in very simple colours but I then use a variety of washes and glazes over the top of that to add a degree of detail and hopefully make it look a little bit more realistic. So I'm taking the same approach here. So there's my glaze applied and as you can see it has changed the look of it quite considerably I think. Now that my glaze has dried, I'm also adding a wash of oil paints. So the colour I'm using here is Burnt Umber. What I'm doing is to just dab a little bit on, and I'm then using a thinner to allow a very thin wash of the paint to, to run over the model. And I'm just sort of dabbing it into the details of the model. Once I've covered the entire surface, I then wipe away the majority of it. That has the effect of leaving the paint in the recesses of the model, and just adds a degree of definition and shading. So the final step here is just to paint the eyes and eyes can be an incredible variety of different shapes and colours and designs so you can really go freehand here and do whatever you like. Uh, what I've decided to do is to paint my eyes bright yellow here using the same yellow that I use for the highlighting of the model. What I'm now doing is adding a touch of additional masking. I'm just sort of basically trying to do a jagged pupil like a cat's eye but with sharp edges down the centre of the eye and I'm doing that with masking fluid. Now that's dry, I'm painting the whole eye black. And as you can see, I can now peel away the black to reveal the yellow beneath. And that just sort of gives a nice bright pupil with a dark iris. So there's my finished painted model. I didn't really have any particular plan or idea as to how this was going to pan out. I mean, obviously sea creatures can be so varied in their coloration that I could have really gone in any number of ways. But I quite like the way this looks. Um, he has gone a little bit camo perhaps. It looks a little bit like he's wearing army camouflage. But then I suppose a lot of sea creatures and wildlife in general does have camouflage. So maybe that works, I don't know. Nevertheless, I hope this has given you some ideas for your own projects and maybe a few techniques that might be useful in the future. I'll definitely be doing some more painting videos in the future on future projects, so please do keep an eye out for that. Uh, but for the meantime, thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Thanks very much for watching. Uh, I'll be posting more videos on future projects, um, so please do uh, subscribe if you'd like to keep up with uh, what's going on. Uh, you can also find out more on my website, which is uh, www.thedarkpower.com, or you can follow me on my Facebook page, uh, just search for The Dark Power.